Hello, my name is Andrew Ahn Westover, and I'm the key pairing director of education and public engagement at the New Museum. I join you today from the unceded land of Lenape people, and I'm glad and I'm like to begin to by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. On behalf of the New Museum, I'm glad to welcome you to today's conversation between Sable Elise Smith and Gary Carrion Muriari. This program series includes over a dozen artist conversations presented in conjunction with our current exhibition, Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America. Programs like this are core to the New Museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. I would particularly like to thank Education and Public Engagement staff members Andrea Calvaries and Derek Wright, as well as the entire New Museum team for their help bringing this program together. New Museum public programs are generously supported by the Research and Residencies Council, and New Museum digital initiatives are generously supported by Hermione and David B. Heller. We also thank our members and supporters like you who help make these programs possible. I'll now share brief biographical notes about this program's featured artist. Sable Elise Smith is an interdisciplinary artist and writer based in New York. Working in photography, video, sculpture, and text, Smith considers how mass incarceration inflicts psychological and physiological traumas on individuals, families, and communities. Her works speak to the profound impact of state-sanctioned violence on the body in particular, drawing from personal and quotidian experiences to address pervasive injustices that are often unseen. Smith's work has been presented in exhibitions at MoMA PS1, the New Museum, the High Line, Brooklyn Academy of Music, Atlanta Contemporary, Queens Museum, Studio Museum in Harlem, Recess Assembly, and Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. She has received awards from the Lewis Com Timpany Foundation, Rima Hort Mann Foundation, Creative Capital, Fine Arts Work Center, Queens Museum, Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, Franklin Furness Fund, and Arts Matters. She is Assistant Professor of Visual Arts at Columbia University. A few logistical notes before we begin. This program will last for approximately one hour. If you would like to ask a question, feel free to use the Q&A function at any time by clicking the Q&A button located on the bottom of your screen to type your question. Please note that this program is being recorded, so your question will be recorded as well. If there is time, our speakers will answer questions during the Q&A at the end of the program. Finally, I encourage you to learn more about upcoming public programs and our full suite of exclusive digital content on our website newmuseum.org. Now, without further ado, I turn the conversation over to the New Museum's Krauss family curator, Gary Carrion Muriari. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I should say we're nearing the last week of Grief and Grievance. Um, it's on view for one more week, so I please would encourage everyone in the city, if you're able to come and um, feel comfortable coming to the museum, please um, check out the show. It's been really wonderful, I think, for all of us to see um, you know, the, all of the time and the effort and the love that went into making the show um, be experienced by such a great um, uh, uh, section of New Yorkers over the past couple of months. Um, I should also say that we're also ending the last week of conversations related to the show as well. And it's been a real honor to be able to speak to so many wonderful artists in the show. And I especially want to thank Andrew and Derek and Andrea for all the hard work they've done in, in making this possible. It's been a, obviously a, a big transition for us, but I think, um, you know, for those of the people who would normally be coming to the show, it has been a real um, uh, incredible experience to, to actually have e even more um, in-depth conversation and, um, and access to the, to the um, crucial voices of the artists around the show. So thank you for everyone who made that possible. And I'm also very happy today to be in conversation with Sable Elise Smith. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, um, she's a, a veteran of the New Museum, um, was part of the show Trigger uh, a few years ago, and also Mirror Tilt, the great exhibition on the fifth floor, which hopefully some of you saw as well. Um, uh, and of course, her work is on view on the second floor of the museum in one of the first galleries you see there. Um, you know, and Sable, thank you for joining me, first of all. Um, you know, I should say as much as possible with these talks, you know, we've been trying, at least I've been trying to, um, you know, not ask the artist to necessarily speak to the themes of the exhibition, which are, you know, very big and very weighty and very important, and also um, maybe had nothing to do with, the, you know, the individual thoughts and impulses that went into the work that you particularly made in, you know, for that um, making the work that, that's involved in the show. Um, but I would say that with your work in particular, some of the ideas that I think about when thinking about the works, and maybe Derek, if you don't mind just pulling up um, the installation shot to start, 
Um, you know, some of the issues that I think about in specifically in relation to these works, which are, you know, of course, very specific and very personal to you, um, you know, do also relate to kind of, I, th I think, larger ideas that are explored in the show. So if you can go to the next image, Derek, here you can see we have a series of six works on view. Um, and then in particular here, we have, um, you know, three works, um, 8,336 nights, 8,345 days, 8,444 days, um, all which, you know, speak to um, the um, the realities, um, the the um, the emotions, the um, the economies of um, the carceral state in America um, through um, the use of images. And you know, I think the idea about the, you know the ethics of images, the economy of images, the circulation of images, and how images can speak to specific experiences of different kinds of violence, um, and and particularly like racially coded violence in America, I think are, are things that I think I think about in your work, and I think that's also those are things that think that that Oakley was thinking about in the making of the show. You know, if you don't mind um, indulging me and in maybe walking us a little bit through the you know um, the kind of genesis of these works, the evolution of these works, because I think you know some of the 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 imagery that you're using also, you know, I think appeared in some sense in an earlier series that you had started before this as well. And, and maybe some of those concerns about dealing with, you know, with these images in particular, um, maybe we can start from there and then see where that takes us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that thinking about the sort of construction of images is a nice um, maybe introduction or kind of like entry point into these works. Um, Cause I also, I mean, images show up in my practice in general in like these sort of uh, ephemeral or maybe fleeting ways, right? Like I'm not necessarily constructing images right. per se, it's about something yeah. else or it's about the apparatus of the, the way that the image is kind of created or uh, disseminated mm -hmm. in the first place is kind mm -hmm. of like the place where I'm intervening. But to kind of back up a little bit, like this specific series, um, well, it, it, it sort of developed out of two specific um, kind of reference images. So one is, I guess, maybe like 2015, around 2014, 2015, I'm kind of like, you know, scouring the internet for different things specifically related to prison and specifically thinking about California state prisons. And I kind of stumbled upon these um, aerial photographs of all the prisons that are sort of um, operated within um, California under the sort of state prison system. Um, and they are these sort of aerial photographs and like, because it's the West, Clo West Coast, like all the prisons are sort of situated in like either these like desert landscapes or these kind of like field or like these like kind of like pastoral fields. So you just see the architecture like in, dropped in this swath of like uh, landscape. Mm -hmm. And they look like these really beautiful like landscape sort of photography images. So I kind of was following the rabbit hole to, to figure out where these um, images sort of began from. And like the, the, the starting point is the California Department of um, Corrections and Rehabilitation, right? And so you find this beautiful sort of landscape image of the prison. And then it's next to a picture of the warden for that specific prison in front of an American flag, like nine times out of 10. Um, and so that became like really bizarre because I was trying to think about, or I began to sort of think about like, the answers to the questions of like why um, these were produced, the impetus for their production. And since they're produced by California State, like who is the audience for these images and what does this image communicate, right? It's just an aerial photograph. So all of the prisons basically look the same. It's just the landscape around them that is sometimes slightly different. Um, and that like the only difference is also if it's like West Coast or sorry, uh, Southern California versus Northern California, right? Like that's where you see the sort of drastic difference. Mm -hmm. um, and so like that kind of like landscape photography, that kind of like vastness and also the the like um, seeing this one sort of building dropped in a landscape uh, of nothing for miles and understanding, right? Like this is a place where people are housed and essentially like sort of picked up and kind of cataloged or removed physically, um, not just by the system, but like also geographically, like away from everything else. Um, and then I was thinking about that in relationship to uh, the sort of prison murals. So the backdrops that are painted inside prison visiting rooms that um, um, people who are incarcerated and their family members or their friends are taking pictures in front of. And right, like that 
photograph is both an important kind of like keepsake, right? Like there's an intimacy in it. There's a kind of like beauty in like having this and having this kind of like memento or just like marker of a different type of uh, time and fellowship, right? But then there's this whole apparatus around like how that image can sort of come into be and like also the sort of economic exchange around it, which um, only the person who's incarcerated can buy this image. So it's not like me, a free person who lives in the, out in the world with a job um, makes, my, I guess it's debatable at what time it is, if I made a livable wage or not, but like makes more than cents upon the dollar, right? And, and, and like thinking about how currency is functioning and just like the kind of spectatorship that also like happens um, in that space and how intimacy plays out in different ways and kind of collapsing uh, those two images together to one, point at the beauty, point at the intimacy, point at the touch, like point at this kind of like these family moments or these memories that happen, but also how that is like completely engulfed by and wrapped up in all of these other um, apparatus that have uh, real impact both um, emotionally, physically, economically, like all these sort of um, um, things that happen. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, I think, you know, it also, they, they get at like the, you know, the failure of those images, like, you know, the inadequacy of those images to like do what, you know, they're aiming to do, let's just, which is say like, you know, uh, like give the comfort of a real family memory or like, you know, the illusion of a real family memory. And then also like, you know, this, these, these backdrops, these kind of idyllic backdrops that somehow represent this kind of like, you know, this sort of tranquil, you know, almost like, you know, a, a place that couldn't be farther from the reality of actual life inside the prison and then you know they end up revealing so much more about you know about how those kind of things oper operate can you talk yeah. a little bit about how you you know um you know i, I think this is also one of the one of the, the failures of, of of the digital program obviously is you know so much of your work you know has an intimate experience in its construction and in the way that you you know situates us as the viewers in relationship to these objects can you talk a little bit about how you know, the kinds of transformations and like the, you know, the, the processes of, of, let's say erasure or framing that went into, into, into that go into the various works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, so um, all the kind of like base photographs are like from my own archive of like family photographs um, and like taking again inside the visiting room in front of these backdrops. Um, and so one thing that I was like interested in like uh, pointing to and thinking through was this kind of like, this idea of this like idyllic landscape or the kind of like beautiful landscape photography and what those things are sort of su supposed to imply mm -hmm. and then how the the actual sort of prison system is using them right so they're like things that they say that the, the system itself says is like um, these images are supposed to be like this moment where of escape for the incarcerated person, right? So you, if you stand in front of it, you can imagine that you're, I don't know, on the Pacific coast or you're on the beach, which is obviously an absurdity. Um, and I think that like to your point, Gary, right? Like maybe part of it is trying to kind of create a space where some normalcy happens, but then that's undermined by everything else that happens to be able to sort of receive that image or, and like also the currency, like the actual transaction that has to happen, which makes the, the actual um, uh, acquisition of these photographs almost impossible, or it's possible to get one photograph where it's like, if four people came to visit, like everybody can't go home with something, right? right so they're right. like, the, like it, it sort of, I don't know, opens the kind of chism or the gap between uh, this like dynamic of free and unfree so much, so much more, right? Mm -hmm. um, and like continues to keep things sort of inaccessible or, or like dangle just, at, just beyond sort of um, arm's reach. Um, and so I think I was, I was interested in like also like how like the flatness of that background and also those sort of area photographs are sort of meant to kind of like flatten and reduce or re yeah, reduce the kind of like experiments or the complexity um, of the things that are sort of happening in that space. Um, and also is this kind of like gesture that like um, provides some anonymity or sort of privacy also to the people who are actually sort of pictured in these images. Um, and so like digitally collaging these other kind of like uh, idyllic uh, landscape images uh, on top of um, the, the actual figures. Um, and then 
like trying to find a way to speak to the magnitude of uh, the experience and the system. And I think in the documentation, like it, it's, it's kind of difficult to uh, articulate, but like these images, especially because that material uh, that they're mad at with is suede, right? Like the suede sort of draws you in and actually feels even more expansive than the 40 by 48 inches that the, the photographs are themselves. And that was important for me to show, right? Like this moment that like has beauty in it, but also has like this pain and it has this sort of violence that is systemic and it has all these, all these sort of touch points in it. And then it's sort of encompassed by this swath of black, right? It is one kind of constellation point in this larger landscape. Yeah, I think that's, just, I think that's the perfect way of, of saying it. You really can't get, you know, it, it, it's, they're incredibly seductive mm -hmm. objects. And I think, I mean, that, I think that speaks to a lot of your work. I think you're so attentive towards you know, like, um, yeah, I, I like towards that the tactility of an object and toward the tactility of an experience. And I think that's also like, I think a great way, you know, to think about, um, uh, uh, you know, actually we, I don't have, somebody's asking for a close up of the image. I don't have a close up, you know, on me, but I think we can drop one in at the end. So, um, but, you know, I think, um, yeah, I, I, part of what I've, you know, I th found important about a lot of your work generally is again, you know, getting back to this idea of images, like, you know, the inadequacy of a photograph or an image to actually speak about, you know, uh, about these realities. And maybe Derek, if you could go on to the, the next, um, the next set of works, um, you know, to an experience that like is, you know, it, it can uh, certainly can be understood, you know, through, um, you know, through language, through a discussion, you know, through like, I think a, a, a very long and, you know, a critical discussion around, you know, the economies of the, the prison state in America. Um, but, you know, there is a, like, you know, there is a, like a sort of sense memory that you bring to the works that I think is so powerful. Um, and, you know, I think maybe we can start talking about these next body of works, which are based on, um, you know, the, you know, again, the, um, uh, the architect, the prison architecture, the the um, you know the furniture that you experience in prison, and you know like let's say like you know like the the sort of like the economies of those objects, like the the sort of like the repetition and like the modular units of those that go in. So this is um, uh, um, uh, uh, pivot two and riot one, both from two thousand nineteen, and which are the start of a you know are part of a series of works that you've done where you're using these objects. Can you talk maybe a little bit about how um, you know about um, the sort of transformations that are involved in these and the kind of like maybe um, how they speak to that kind of the ubiquity of these uh, of certain aspects of, of um, the aesthetics of, of prison architecture as, as mm -hmm. you've experienced. Yeah, um, it's funny. I was just having a conversation with someone uh, this morning and kind of talking about the, the use of repetition in my work and one like, I mean, there, there are a number of influences or sort of places um, things that sort of have influenced that use poetry being one of them, but then also like, especially in the, in the context of like talking about the carceral landscape, right? Like there is a ubiquity, right? There's this kind of like perpetual and insistent nature of it. And so in that sense, right? Like the repetition and the ser seriality kind of like speak to that. Um, and I think it, it also is, this is kind of an aside, but it's, it's funny. Cause like, I mean, I definitely think about like, like each object at the time, right? And like uh, make decisions that, you know, make sense for me that the object can communicate what it needs to on its own when it's sort of taken, or like moved around different places and out of context. But I think for me, the most exciting thing and the thing that I'm sort of thinking about more is like all of these things, like even the sort of understanding that all of these arms are sort of a part of my practice or the moments where they like, you know, uh, meet again and they sort of are existing in the same places and like, how that has a different type of echo. Um, and so the accumulation of all of these objects and their potential just uh, juxtapositions um, having even more sort of intensity or friction. Um, and so I think it, it's that same sort of logic that kind of uh, took me to this series of works that I kind of like, um, I guess informally call like the table series or table sculptures. Mm -hmm. um, because again, like, I started to think about and become maybe interested in kind of like uh, just locating a set of ideas um, in the site of the prison visiting room and kind of talking about the things that happen there because it's a kind of limo, limbo space, right? Where 
different types of constituencies are uh, kind of thrusted together, right? Uh, people who are incarcerated, people who are not incarcerated, the correctional officers, sometimes like vendors, like all, all of these different people navigating a space where that is um, really fraught, right? Um, and also like, like I think it, it um, I don't know what's the word. It's like I mean, it's an incredibly sinister space, basically. Like there, there are no um, rights for anyone in that space, and you can feel that kind of thickness and the kind of power and the dynamics that play out in so many ways that have nothing to do with like keeping people space in that space in that um, keeping people safe in that space. I got a tongue talk tongue twisted there. Um, and so I think the the visiting room became really interesting to me because also I think lots of things that can happen or do happen in that space are also subtle. There are things that like um, some people might not uh, immediately be able to identify or label as violence or a type of violence. There's a lot of um, like small intimate or sort of nonverbal um, uh, types of interactions and things. And that was something like I, I'm interested in kind of like bringing that type of murkiness to the, to the surface so that it can be named um, as such. Um, and so like these visiting room tables or the furniture um, is, it, is an interesting metaphor for a number of reasons. It, it gets to the economies, right? Like there is a billion dollar industry built off of the production of these tables, which also sometimes produce things solely for prisons or also uh, public school systems. So there's a, um, an interesting kind of interest. Um, embedded in there. And then the fact that, right, like this is something, this is an object that requires a body. And so the, the, the success and the longevity of the business, of that business uh, demands that there are bodies that can occupy these objects, right. um, which, you know, I think that's a kind of elucidating um, idea to think about, um, especially in relationship to then like how or at what scale or how many or what are the quantities of people who are sort of incarcerated and why? What are all the interests that are sort of invested in that um, space? Um, it's also the kind of like location that you're fixed to for the number of hours that you're um, on a visit, right? So you do a different type of time um, at this space, but then it's also like the location where intimacy, exchange, like communication, like all these other things that could be private and that could be shared and that can be um, maybe preserved also happen there. But again, it's under uh, this like multiple sort of levels and layers of surveillance right. and this like whole apparat apparatus. So I think, so just like then logistically, I decided to kind of um, uh, replicate one-to-one -one scale versions of these and then use the tables as like these kind of like modular building blocks to either make other architectural structures or other objects. Sometimes the objects are like completely obsolete, right? Like their function is then, kind of destroyed because of how they're configured. Um, but it, it again, kind of like points to this like real perpetual and kind of self-fulfilling cycle. Um, yeah, well, it's, I think it's, you know, it's interesting to think about these, you know, in light of, you know, other like, let's say like you know, module you know, or the way that sort of certain minimal sculpture, you know, from the sixties onwards, you know, like mm -hmm. you know, um, created a, a sort of maybe an illusion of like this kind of utopian design where like where a modular object, a stainless steel object is perfectly designed to fulfill mm -hmm. a function that, you know, somehow, you know, betters our lives or better society. And we're here, you have the opposite. It's a stainless steel object that has been perfectly designed mm -hmm. to regulate the body to, mm -hmm. you know, to deny, you know, um, you know, real intimacy to like, you know, to really structure all movements of the person who is meant to be occupying that seat for a brief moment in time. Um, and then, you know, turning it, turning it into an even more kind of absurd, you know, um, or, you know, or, or, or some, somehow blowing up that, that perfect function to create something that's maybe more, um, more evocative or, or maybe more liberatory. Mm -hmm. to a certain degree. And, and right, like also those minimalist objects were like meant to kind of like empty emotion or like empty the context, right? The specificity of the object. And like, I'm precisely interested in the other thing, right? Like reasserting their context, reasserting all of that information and, and kind of like brushing up against the tension of like trying to like pluck something and take it out of context and, yeah. and like marvel at it or, or, or the idea that like things can be taken out of their context also. Right. Can we talk a little bit about this one in particular, which is a kind of, you know, um, 
you know, it's uh, the title's a swear close closes it, which is a kind of threshold. And like, you know, um, you know, the, the form of the arch is very evocative, but also, you know, quite specific, I think, in, in its reference to prison architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like I was, I think, and this is the, the, the first one that I actually ever made. Um, and so there was, I think, a, as a kind of uh, first stab at like thinking about how, um, like this sort of system, right? Like these modular building blocks could put, like have this sort of potential to take on this other kind of like resonance um, and to see how far I could also push, right? Like the design um, and the, the actual sort of like configuration of these pieces. So to find out like, you know, where it structurally breaks down, what the possibilities are and how much that could be sort of manipulated. Um, I think one thing that would that felt important especially at that time because i didn't necessarily know that like this would be um a kind of a, a, ser a series um i knew i was in, i had a couple of designs that i was interested in but also like didn't know the capacity or the opportunity or the access to continue to make these so there was something important about the monumental scale um and to like really and especially because i made this for a specific show um to have the body dwarfed and like really confronted with this object and this like object that like maybe everyone doesn't have a kind of like lived experience or proximity to prison or sort of the visiting room but you understand a table and a chair you understand how it's supposed to function and where your body is supposed to be in relationship to it so to to bring a kind of heightened intensity to the function of this object um and um also like um, important to kind of like begin to hint at the repetition. Um, and then like, again, pointing to like this threshold, but then also something that feels like, I don't know, like weirdly sci-fi or kind of like otherworldly or, or, and like also like sometimes they look militaristic, but maybe like retro futurist militaristic. Um, and like to, especially this one, which is like, in an exhibition context is like always situated somewhere near an entrance. So there is like this, this weird choreography where like people are either forced to sort of pass through it or it's situated just so that like, you literally have to like, I don't know, squeak, like hug the wall to kind of like avoid it and seeing how people like, like how it is a kind of intimidating object um, and how that sort of changes, the, I think, um, our expectations or assumptions about, right, like something that's supposed to be just functional or something that is neutral, right? And so then like maybe that draws our attention back to other aspects of the architecture and how that actually like obviously directs our bodies through space. And we all have a kind of like, I think subconscious awareness of that, but like beginning to actually look at it and interrogate like what kind of impact does it have or why is it directing us in sort of certain ways? Um, and then also just like thinking historically is sort of about archways is like um, um, uh, like sometimes in buildings like being this kind of um, what is the word that I'm looking for right now I just lost it um, this load bearing like structure right like mm -hmm. like something that is structural being able to like actually hold up right um, a larger building or some sort of facade right and what happens if this thing isn't there. Um, and just this kind of like cyclical coming and going, right? Like you don't know that if this is an entrance or an exit. Yeah, 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 and uh, yeah. I think there's yeah there there's something like yeah, and also there you know there's something it feels threatening to pass through it. It feels like you know you feels like you're being exposed to pass through it. I know it has nothing to do. I mean it, it really has nothing to do. But it, like it, uh, this piece always made me think for whatever reason of that. Uh, you know this Chris Burden piece where he like installed um, like a turnstile at the entry of a museum that theoretically mm. was like going to collapse the building every time you pass through it. I always thought about this work and thinking about, you know, yeah, wh where the architecture, where the, you know, where the, the reference to the work comes from, but yeah, that just, there's something so, so menacing about it. And so like overwhelming about it that I think is mm -hmm. really incredible. Um, can you talk a little bit about the color blue that's used in it too? Cause I th know that the blue is very specific. And I think, you know, obviously, you know, it's blue is a color that appears in your work in multiple, multiple, different arenas and has such a heavy kind of presence as it does in other works in the show, but I think yours is obviously very specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's a really good question. I mean, obviously, yes, blue has been very, or has been, is, and will continue to be very kind of like, I don't know, just like important, both poetic and kind of like literal thread that like weaves itself throughout the projects. Um, and it also like, there's a number of kind of like associations, like linguistically, sonically, um, like, other kind of like also geographic references to like the color and I'm interested 
And so I've been become like sort of fi fixated on blue and also rooting that as this kind of like rhyme or motif um, in the practice too, because I think it also brushes up against um, and it doesn't uh, engage with the way that we think about and sort of talk about color theory in an art context. Um, and also like the context and the sort of references um, in my practice and like, I guess the kind of like uh, the lack of hierarchy and the types of references um, that I'm using is um, incredibly important. And so like this, like thinking about color in this way is one um, is, is one thing that sort of is kind of like perpetual. Um, but then for the scope, these sculptures, um, right? Like I've seen a number of kind of different kind of color palettes and they're all these, these kind of like um, municipal kind of hues. Um, and so uh, that like actually exist. And so this blue is one of them that I kind of like tweaked a little bit. And I thought it was important to like stick with the kind of like uniformity of like the, cons the like insistent and kind of consistent color throughout. Um, and also to kind of, uh, again, like, right, like we talk about architecture and like, this is obviously like a specific object, but then also like the color, um, the like the paint or the texture of a color, like also these like, things that we wouldn't necessarily identify like um or sort of point to like always right like also has this kind of like resonance too and so just like bringing to the surface like the buzz in a fluorescent light is like another thing that I kind of like talk about or have used before and so like in the same way to think about like color also is this kind of like this thing that sort of lingers with you and what they're sort of doing with that yeah yeah the kind of space that yeah that color is able to create yeah I think there's a there's a beautiful like I'm sure some many people here you know saw the um, the marking time show and also you know have the book, but I think there's a beautiful in Nicole's text where she talks about your work in particular. There's a like an incredibly beautiful selection where she talks about like this carceral blue and the kind mm -hmm. of you know and what that means like you know in this moment of you know of you know um, like late capitalism and and also you're you know balancing with yours, which is like you know much more I think you know poetic and subjective like but also like equally you know true to that experience. I think mm -hmm. I encourage everybody to buy that book and seek it out if you want to hear more about the work. Um, before we move on, I know somebody, uh, people are, somebody's very eager to know some of the technical questions about the work, but if you had to paint the tabletops before the structure was formed, or like maybe just the, like that, you know, the, the um, maybe the uh, logistics of, of, of assembling the object in, in general. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, these are all, uh, well, I guess not all of them. Most of them are made, like the larger ones are made out of aluminum smaller ones are stainless steel and they're all just powder coated. So like a kind of like, I don't know, car paint style um, after they're um, uh, welded and like cut and um, put together. Yeah. Um, Derek, can you move on to the next photo? So I think we're jumping around a, a bit, but, um, but I know this is a series that I think is, you know, Probably very familiar to many of um, the, uh, many of people who've seen your work before, and and you know, they were shown in, you know, in in both some of your gallery museum exhibitions. But the um, um, the series based on this coloring book, and I think the story is a bit well known too. You know, a coloring book that you found on 125th Street that is kind of this like, um, you know, uh, something designed for children to somehow make you know the um, the the justice system or the experience of like you know of of the justice system seem, you know, warm and fuzzy and friendly, um, you know, uh, this kind of introductory book, which you then have blown up and then transformed in these kind of, you know, like gestural, um, you know, sometimes, you know, erasures, sometimes like, you know, um, complete erasures and, and um, Derek, if you can flip through a few of them, that would be great. Um, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, they become, you know, you know, you're kind of you're both playing with the image and then, and sometimes completely superseding the image with information that, you know, is, um, sometimes contradictory, sometimes, um, you know, um, uh, uh, seemingly quite personal and, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's uh, even humorous in, in some mm -hmm. moments. Um, you know, with this work too, you know, I think there's a great, um, maybe it's hard to like, you know, I don't want you to have to like talk through it, but I think, you know, one of the, you know, things that I think, um, one of the great, I think, comments on these works, which sometimes, you know, when I have read other, you know, you know, a, a totally sympathetic criticism to them in some ways, like they sort of take them as they are rather than maybe like what, you know, or they take like the, the coloring book is like the text rather than like the, the gesture on top of it as maybe the text. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think one of the, I think the great things, I think maybe it was in Hannah Black's text for the studio museum where she talked about, you know, these are really not for children, they're for, they're objects for adults to like, you know, make the, you know, um, to kind of 
Mm -hmm. give them a tool to to make to make the justicism seem you know you know honest and true and and good mm -hmm. um you know like what kind of process it was it for you to like um you know what did you feel like you needed to do to these images to make them usable i guess mm -hmm. let's say let's, maybe let's start from there like in terms of like you know like what were, what was your process of working through them and working with them to make them productive images rather than you know this kind of like ready-made tool of indoctrination, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't think anybody's ever phrased it that way or kind of got at that as the as, as the question before. Um, I think, and so probably to date, I've made like 60 of them. Um, and so like, I think back in September, I was actually having a conversation with a curator about this, uh, about these. Um, and she asked me like, what has changed because we were talking about some of the, the more recent ones and what have I sort of learned and what have I sort of adapted, right? In working with the, like this sort of, I don't know if it's like five or six set of like images over and over again. Um, and I think the, like I found this object. I also love that that story is famous now or that it's like a real known <laughs> story. But like, I found this object probably about in like, I think 2015. Um, and I sat with it for a long time. Like I just was sort of compelled to pick it up because of my own like fascination and interest um, and kind of like a serendipity that day, that day honestly. Um, and I think I sat with these, this coloring book for maybe two years before I ever did anything with it. And once I sort of realized what it was, it wasn't that I sort of sat down and I was like, I'm gonna make art about this or with this one day. Um, but I sort of, when I found the, the the book, I was sort of flipping through the pages and immediately like, uh, I think it felt incredibly sinister and dark. It was like frightening, one of the pages. Um, and I, it was um, a kind of question and configuration and also knowing the intended audience and that this is like an educational or sort of didactic tool and thinking about like, like what, it, uh, like uh, my sort of, um, what do you call it, um, experience with early childhood development and understanding, okay, like I'm asking you to use your motor skills on this and you're reading it or someone's reading it to you and all of these sort of um, activities that really sort of solidify um, and um, indoctrinate and sort of teach and leave a, a kind of impression um, both like ideologically and also visually, right, with the, with the child. And that also at every turn in this book what is being asked of you in different ways and through different activities is to sort of foreclose your imagination and also to continue to sort of project yourself into this book right into this kind of trap right. um and so i just like sat with that for a while um and like i think once i finally decided to make work with them i also didn't know that this would sort of be an ongoing series but i i just wanted to one kind of show that this exists um, and then also like sort of subtly point to or create a scenario where the, the, the language, the text, and the image together could actually kind of like be considered and meditated on and that that also had to be a public experience. It couldn't be at the intimate scale at a book. It couldn't be something that felt private. It had to be um, this larger sort of space where like, I mean, the scale of them is like, you know, two people could be sort of side by side looking at this or like a cluster of people and you're sort of aware of your body in relationship to it and the bodies around you and like what the, the like, the, the, I guess the speed at which you're sort of comprehending what's actually happening and what you're being told. Um, and so I, I think at first it really was about like, okay, like these have to be kind of like frenetic, they have to be performative, they have to be about energy, about like sort of just getting pigment on the page and uh, finding ways to produce as many marks as possible that are either a childlike mark or uh, like marks that are sort of contradictory that point to like, I don't know, multiple people could be interacting with this coloring book or it could be an adult and a child or it could be siblings. So trying to like create a world where you saw all of these different sort of experiences, lives, and types of bodies sort of projected into them. Um, and then as it sort of accumulated, then it became about like, then I think the interventions became slightly different because the accumulation has a different type of intensity or the repetition has a different type of intensity. Yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah, in person, they are, you know, incredibly successful at that. And, you know, I also, I, when I think about that question about like, you know, what you, you know, like the ready-made object and the ready-made, even the ready-made image and like, you know, what you try to do, with your work, I think it, you know, again, gets to the larger question about like how images are meant to function and what you're, you know, like, what would it mean to like, you know, 
just showing an image of this as, as a found object mm -hmm. or like, you know, even showing it like, you know, again, maybe even thinking about the question of images more generally, like, you know, what does it mean to show images of a prison more generally or, you know, or incarcerated, you know, um, you know, people more generally and, you know, like, um, you know, within the show, it's maybe even the question about like, what does it mean to show images of, you know, of, of black mourning or death or like, you know, in, in the catalog, I think Elizabeth Alexander speaks a lot about, you know, images of violence towards, you know, towards black people in America, like, you know, and, you know, wh that, what that experience is like, you know, and I think in regards to like your work and thinking about the carceral state, like, you know, showing an image of a prison is showing something that is working the way that some people intended and want it to work, you know, even if, you know, at its most brutal and its most violent, an image like that is also, you know, you know, you're to, you're somewhat how leaving it up to people to decide whether or not they want it to work that way or not. Whereas I think your work in getting at this sort of, you know, um, um, at, you know, like uh, uh, even an imagined psychology, uh, you know, uh, uh, is I think uh, speaks a lot more profoundly. And I think even you know, um, you know, the like the tactility and the sensation and like you know, like the way that you know, like you know, your neon pieces then like you know, take over the space of the room and envelop the person in within language. I think is is what makes them so successful. Mm -hmm. And then also, right, like these aren't the, like the obvious or the kind of quintessential images of prison or jail or, or arrest or anything or or even like the kind of uh, like, uh, I guess, obvious topics that we assume would be sort of spoken about when you hear that word. Right. Um, I'm kind of in, like really interested in like teasing out all like all of this kind of like quietness right and I don't necessarily think this is quiet like I think like this specific <laughs> image like I think it still is frightening to me what it what it does on its yeah. structural level when you take time to kind of like dissect it um mm -hmm. but it isn't the obvious thing to talk about and isn't the easiest thing to point at and say that's fucked up but I think this is fucked up yeah, and absolutely. I'm like yeah. pointing at those invisible fucked up things I guess yeah yeah no I think this one is yeah yeah you're right it's, it's one of the most disturbing ones in the series. Um, if we can go on maybe to the, the last one, I think we, we were maybe the second to last one again, which is this kind of, um, uh, this kind of letter or this, you know, this description of a, a like a, a, an older white woman, um, you know, t telling a story, you know, like this process of indoctrination, you know, taking it from this coloring book to like the real like lived kind of, um, you know, way that racism and, and, you know, and kind of, you know, is, is, uh, is passed on in this kind of um, in, in a very intimate, you know, um, sort of innocent sort of level. Like, you know, I think this, um, uh, which is, you know, I mean, I don't, there's not much for you to necessarily say about it, but I think like one of the, you know, the skills of your, of I think one of the beautiful things about your work is, you know, your propensity for speaking with different voices and like really, you know, um, profoundly. And I think that, you know, the way that language um, uh, is so malleable and so like enveloping in your work, I think is really special. Uh, I just wanted to show this one as a lead in to maybe the neon piece, if you could go in Derek, to skip to more. There you go. All right, so this is part of your landscape series. And again, this is one where, you know, again, where you're using, you know, a, a very familiar, like, you know, both I think um, like from our everybody's experience of life, but also like within that realm of art history, like the form of the neon, um, uh, you know, as as a as a tool to talk about something that's quite larger. Can you talk a little bit about like the, how this story began? Um, and again, I think we're going to get back to something we talked at the beginning, which is landscape and and um, and maybe the like the more political implications of landscape. Can you talk about the series and 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 how you've approached maybe different approaching it from different aspects across different works? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think for me, for me, this series like there there's so many kind of like complex, I think, like registers and experiences that can happen when you sort of see it in person. Um, and I think it's like those sort of smaller things that like are actually really that that like really excite me about the possibility of like neon and why I sort of chose it for this specific um, uh, series um, that is sort of in tangent to the language, right? Like there, the, like the language, obviously, like there's this kind of like um, poetry that really shows up, especially in like the series of neons. And so there's like the narrative of the text. So what is the language actually sort of telling us? Um, then there's the kind of like experience of reading it, right? Which is this other kind of like time-based experience that slows you down a little bit, but then also you're staring at uh, neon, right? This sort of bright light. Um, and especially at the different scales, right? Like sometimes that experience of reading it is difficult because it's a harsh light. Like it isn't necessarily soft 
um, and beautiful, although like like the material does have this sort of seductive and beautiful quality, right? Like in filling up the room. Um, and I think that like that the kind of like touch and glow and uh, reflection of the light too, right? Its ability to touch everything or sort of spread out, right? Is something seeping into, right? Like how it spreads or sort of uh, reflects on the ground and sort of creates a larger space than it actually, a larger space and presence than it actually physically occupies. Um, is something that's subtle, but like maybe that is kind of like um, gleamed, um, right? Like the piece is also about power and it's a kind of perpetual power, power, right? Like continuously on and kind of like draining like actually lots of wattage. Um, <laughs> and then there's the kind of sonic quality, which again is slow, but becomes registered once you're out of the environment of it, right? Like like the the ambient sound, I guess the silence is sort of louder or like the, the fact that that drone is missing like becomes maybe more visible when you're aware. Or, sorry, when you're um, when you sort of leave the piece, and so I think that like kind of pointing to that small impact right on the body, right, like a, a, like an actual kind of like awareness, like oh, there's something still with me, or like I still have the sensation of this, um, and I think thinking about the kind of like larger uh, structure that is the kind of reference for the work, like th that's important and that's sort of profound. Um, and then like it, it is sort of the scale of these things are like quite large. They're always horizontal. So kind of like pointing to this idea of like landscape painting, landscape photography, like the kind of sublime of natural light and like all the kind of like like weird and convoluted and like problematic uh, uh, indoctrinations, like especially like Western like uh, uh, Manifest Destiny. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and like kind of using that as this kind of like lingering legacy for um, like what these landscapes um, are and what they sort of suggest. And then kind of like playing around with that idea of the backdrop again too, because I know this is like a, a, a very kind of like mm, familiar and seductive type of um, uh, material and artwork, right? Like people are interested in like uh, trying to image themselves around it in front of it and like it kind of like there's a kind of um, I think uh, fight um, and almost sometimes it like refuses right like photographic capture um, but like it, it creates this kind of backdrop in this site where like like I don't know a hundred times out of a hundred times people are trying to like set up a photo shoot in front of this and it like absolutely refuses that but I'm interested in like all of those kind of like subtle dynamics and choreographies. I mean, I think this is kind of like an aside, but especially the neon piece that was in the new museum show in Trigger, yeah. like I talk to the security guards every time I come there and they tell me about like <laughs> laughing about hundreds and hundreds of people like photographing themselves in front of like, I don't know, a phrase about fisting or like yeah. a really violent <laughs> encounter and they're like cheesing. And like, I see these things pop up over the internet and like, you know, there, there's something really interesting in that ability to um, ignore or mm -hmm. use something to your advantage or to fulfill your desires or to just misrecognize, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I mean, I, for me, like this series is, is you know, I think um, one of the most powerful and effective series, I think, of the last several years by any artist. It really is, you know, across the board, it's just really remarkable. And, you know, somebody was asking the question about, like, you know, how much you can understand without context. And I think, you know, the, the beauty of these works is, like, you know, you become, the language is seductive and you become lost in, in the position that you would have it in relationship to these works, like who you're identifying with in mm -hmm. these works and, like, you know, where your position is as a viewer. And again, you know, like this, how we think about, um, yeah, like, ourselves in relationship to uh, to a piece of text, but are also to like a neon piece within an mm -hmm. institution. I think, you know, these works also push up against the limits of an institution and like what, you know, how are, and I think maybe if we speak about the last one, that will also speak a little bit towards like the larger framework about where your works and how, like what they actually ask of institutions, I think is really interesting and powerful. But I think, yeah, this, um, the way that it, a piece like this and a lot of these pieces evoke, you know, the language of, of landscape painting without, you know, being a painting at all, I think is really powerful. I love to think about this work in relationship to like, you know, to Mark Bradford's work on the um, on the fourth floor, which is also like, you know, obviously like in, you know, in a very seductive way in, in mm -hmm. dialogue with, the his, you know, with the history of landscape painting, but it's also very much about like the, you know, like the political and like the racist use of landscape and mapping, mm -hmm. like in, in, in connection to a very specific community. Um, and I think, you know, what, you know, what, what your work really does is like offer a way into some really difficult and like really urgent conversations around, you know, spectatorship and, 
and and power and um, and institutional structures. So, um, so we're getting close to the end. Maybe we can go to we can go to the last image. Um, and again, you know, thinking about landscape, this is a piece that you did for the Highline um, called Ironwood Land. Um, you know, which again, obviously, you know, the references are are you know again you know, are somewhat familiar. Obviously, of course, the Hollywood sign, but then Ironwood. Um, uh, um, um, which is you know, the um, the prison complex, um, and you could talk, maybe talk a little bit about the, like the maybe the, if you thought about it a little bit differently in terms of like the um, the context of doing a piece on the High Line in the context, and obviously the context in Chelsea, and like what you know, um, like what you were thinking about in terms of institutions and structures in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, and this piece is title cream like the acronym too after the wu-tang uh song so cash rules everything around me um but i think it, this was actually i think the, the 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 question i've been thinking about um more and like in conversation with like there was potentially like thinking about like what happens if i install this piece somewhere else um because this piece was commissioned uh by the high line so it was first made for like literally cited on 20th street for this specific uh reason and context and sort of location um i've been thinking about uh this kind of like riff on the hollywood um song the original hollywood sign which read hollywood land which was initially um supposed to be this kind of like like souped up uh, uh billboard uh, for um uh what do you call it? a subdivision Right. And then like eventually it became this like iconographic, like historical kind of like landmark and the land was dropped. But it was initially created um, as a real estate advertisement and it was advertising a segregated um, suburb. Um, and so I thought that was um, interesting to think about uh, specifically in the context of Chelsea, thinking about real estate, the enmeshment of um, art and it is both in that location and then also used to be um, a, a women's prison or sort of jail right there on 20th street um, that obviously isn't in um, uh, use or sort of function anymore. Um, and also I've been interested in, and I think it kind of has come in in like slow and subtle ways. Um, also the context of entertainment and our entertainment and like how violence is kind of like a mesh in that. And also like, obviously, especially in like popular and commercial commercial entertainment. So like Hollywood films, for example, right? Like the kind of how our media uh, perpetuates and creates and positions uh, these images of criminal or violence or prison or all these, all, a number of things, all, obviously like also our sort of uh, perpetuates our racial stereotypes, anything we can sort of think of, right? Um, and I think even even more recently, I sort of been slowly bringing out, um, I think, more of a kind of direct address of entertainment. But that was like, I think in here, it definitely is like the kind of like beginning inklings of that. Um, and then this thing sort of uh, like each word flashes um, and you can see it or you could see it like all the way on the West Side Highway. Um, so the the reach was really interesting. And obviously, like the, like. Uh, the High Line is this kind of uh, prime tourist, uh, um, what do you call it, destination, right? So people are also going here and like taking family photographs and like photographing, like I think the kind of uh, performative backdrop or apparatus that's sort of built into the work is also like something that I am thinking about actively and like also is really important to me. Like, I think it's it's funny and it's telling to see how people interact with things um, and the level of inappropriateness that continues to escalate as people interact with things. And that that becomes another material or just activation in the work, right? Like the people in the space and what happens when people are in relationship to this. Um, I kind of went on a tangent, but those are some of the things that I was thinking about. Um, in relationship to yeah this piece yeah no it's a really it was a really fantastic piece and i think you know also there it you know there are obviously like very tough questions about you know um like you know the um the the economy of prisons in america and like the the intersection with real estate interests and like you know and those are hard questions that also obviously in, intersect with art institutions like you know mm -hmm. all our art all art institutions in new york mm -hmm. also have like those questions mm -hmm. to ask too which i think mm -hmm. was what made it to me a really you know important and impressive piece and i think hopefully people will continue to think about it mm -hmm. um so i think now we're re reaching kind of the end but if people have a couple questions um we're happy to answer them you can drop them in the chat um 
And I think um, there was a couple questions about the um, about the uh, prison architecture questions, which we I think pretty much answered. Um, somebody asked if you took a picture of the execution of the modular structure, but I don't I don't know. I, I, we we don't have it, but I'm assuming maybe it was some documentation. But um, but I guess if not, then. Um, Maybe we'll just end it here. Sable, okay. thank you so much. It's always really great to talk to you. And thank you so much. Thank you for being in multiple new museum shows. It's, you know, <laughs> we're, we are one of our, obviously one of our favorite artists. Um, and re, yeah, we're obviously um, really grateful to your contribution to this, I think, really important show. So yeah, thank you so you. much. And hopefully we'll see you soon. Cool. Okay. Right, take care. Everybody, take care. Bye.